let's go to Genesis 8 tonight and pick up where we left off a while back. Um, it was the beginning of January when we did Genesis 7, and then there's been uh, snow events and fifth Sundays, and I was out of town, and all kinds of things going on. So we are glad to, at least I'm glad to be back at it, um, and into the Word here. Um, Genesis chapter 8. All right, so Genesis 7 ended. I mean, I feel like it's been a while, so we need to just kind of remember where we came from. Genesis 7 ended with these words. You can follow along in verses 23 and 24. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. So we read here how chapter 7 ended. The flood had ravaged the world. Um, Everything destroyed. Everything was dead that breathed air on the planet except for those who were contained in the ark. That's where we left. And that is a somber thought that the world got so bad that God decided to uh, submerge the evil literally and, and stamp it out by taking the life of everything that breathed except for those who trusted Him. Destruction, death, and the waters were prevailing at that time. And so when you end a, a chapter like that, um, it is uh, a sad, a, an awful thought. But chapter 8 begins with some encouraging words. If you look at that, verse 1, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. So chapter 7 ends with death, destruction, and waters prevailing on the earth. The judgment of God on the world's evil. And chapter 8, the way that God always does things, starts with, and God remembered. Um, Some translations even have, but God remembered. They start with, but, and it's that contrast of what we just read. Nonetheless, it doesn't change those next two words, God remembered. Now, we understand that God doesn't have to be reminded of anything, does he? God's uh, uh, omniscient. He doesn't have to be reminded of anything. He, he's all knowing. He, he knows everything and is never uh, that, that anything is without his mental reach. So it's not that he had to be reminded of something, but what it is, is, is it is covenant language. And what I mean by that is God, um, as he promised in chapter 6, verse 18, I believe, was going to follow through on his promise. And this passage, 8.1, starts with God following through on his promise. And so when we read God remembered, it's not that he called it to mind, it's that he's following through on his promise. And uh, I would like to point out that every time we read in the Bible that, you know, there was destruction and death and wrath, uh, we see by the grace of God life coming from death. And this, it's no different here. God remembered Noah. In other words, God recalled. God is going to keep his promise. Every living thing and all the cattle, God had them on his heart. God was going to fulfill his promise to cattle. Isn't that something? So if God's going to fulfill his promise to cattle and all those living creatures in the ark, certainly he's going to fulfill his promise to those who are made in his likeness and his image. Now, when we come to verse 2, we're going to contrast this with a a verse in chapter 7. Chapter 7 is all about destruction. Chapter 8 is all about a recreation. So if we look at verse 2, we see, The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. Now, contrast that with chapter 7, verse 11. For some of you, it may be on the next page. You can just look right at it there. 
Chapter 7, verse 11 says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great, great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. Look at verse 12. And the rain was upon the earth. Now we see a reversal. God opened the windows of heaven, and it rained like crazy. God uh, broke up the fountains of the deep, and the water raised from the ground. And it rained like crazy in chapter 7. Death, destruction, and wrath, and judgment. And now in chapter 8, after what God had to accomplish was accomplished, we see a reversal in verse 2. The windows are closed, the fountains of the deep are stopped, and the rain stops falling. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the power of the creator of the universe, who at his word can flood the earth, and at his word can stop every bit of it just by saying so. This is the power of our God. This is the redemption of our God, where there is death and judgment and wrath and destruction, he can bring life from it, and he does it here. So it's an interesting contrast of 8.2 and 7.11. God is reversing destruction to bring life again. That's what our God does. That's what marks our God. He takes something that's dead and makes it alive again. He does that in many ways with many things, not just people. And he's going to do it with the earth here as we see in this chapter. He has the power to make promise, to make promises like bringing life from death and then delivering on those promises. He doesn't just talk the talk, but he walks the walk. So we come to verse 3 here as we've seen the reversal now. God is uh, fulfilling his promise, his covenant. He's reversed the destruction to bring life. In verse 3, we read that the waters gradually recede from the earth. It says, and the waters return from off the earth continually. Maybe gradually, you could read. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. They began to recede. All that came up is going down. And this is a theme. Um, I don't want to spoil kind of what I'm going to say in a little bit in, in a better instance, but... Um, what God is doing here, what seems redundant. When we read things in the Bible and it seems like God is just kind of repeating himself or the author just keeps kind of saying the same thing, it's like, okay, we get it. Um, it is actually a, a, uh, a tool that they use in narratives, especially in the Hebrew language. It's like putting an exclamation point on what God is doing when he's redundant or when he repeats himself. So it, sometimes you get like, okay, we get it. Well, that's, that's God's way of saying, stamping it with that exclamation point, okay? So now we come to verse 4. And we can't just skip through this because we want to, because it's just like, yeah, minutia. And the ark rested on the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, if you've watched any documentaries, you could Google documentaries. You can go on your smart TV and find documentaries of all these people who think they found Noah's Ark, okay? Maybe they did. I don't know. I've never been there. I haven't seen it with my own eyes. There's some, there's some weird people out there, and then there's some people that are a little bit more believable, but they say they found the Ark. Don't know if they have or not. But when we read the mountain of Ararat here, it's not like it's one peak that they can go to and just zero in on a plot of land. It's, it's a range there between Russia, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and all those areas. It's all kind of a range there. And it's anybody's best guess exactly where the ark rested. We don't know, um, but we do know that God said it was on Ararat, that mountain range. But more important than that is what we skip over in that verse. And it talks about the seventh month. The seventh month. The seventh month in the religious calendar for Hebrews is the month Tishri, the most important month of all of their sacred feasts and holidays. Uh, it included, now, not yet, not in this, at this point in history, you didn't have the feasts and the holidays and what they call 
convocations, okay? You didn't have that yet. But it's important to note that what did happen in the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar future was the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Trumpets and Tabernacles, and what they would call the Sacred Assembly, the Gathering of the People, um, Pilgrimage Feasts. And you can look that up in Leviticus 23, verses 23 through 36. If you write that down, you can check that out later. But that's the feast. That month was very special to the Jews for feast days in the future. So there's something about this month. And it's fitting that the end of judgment would come at this time. It's fitting that the day of atonement would come as, as Noah is going to step off the ark and offer a sacrifice. It's fitting that all this happens in this time frame. So we want to focus on Ararat and be like, oh, I wonder where it's at. And, and where the ark is does not matter to you and me. But what's going on here is God is setting up a system. He's setting up a way of doing things. And he's like, that seventh month, for whatever reason God ordained it, is going to be a special day in the life of his people. That day of atonement. Very important time. The Feast of Tabernacles and Trumpets, incredibly important as it points back and forward. And all this happens in the same month. Then we come to verse 5. And the Testing one. All right. Woohoo. All right. Thank you. Just in case. In case I get shot again. <laughs> I mean, it was just the noise, but I felt like I got shot. You know, if I would have went down, that would have been good. But anyway. All right. Verse 5. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. So now the water's decreasing enough that Noah can look out that window and see tops of mountains. So it's getting better. This is 72 or 73 days, counting the first day, after the ark rested, after it landed, the waters had receded enough that Noah could actually see mountaintops. I mean, think about that. This water is receding slowly. And you know, isn't it kind of... How, how things happen in life. Trials and suffering seem to come on quickly, out of nowhere. And they rise up and they, they grasp us and they, and they destroy and they hurt and they bring suffering almost immediately, but it takes time for us to get settled after something like that. And just a reminder that it's kind of how life goes. We come to verses 6 and 7. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Forty days after the mountain peaks were visible, Noah decides to release a raven. You may recall that the number 40 is the number for the period of waiting or testing in the Bible. And it's interesting to me that 40 days after the mountain peaks were visible, when Noah got the first indication that the water was actually receding, 40 days later, he releases a raven to kind of see how things are going now. Remember, there was one window, right? It was up. And so he couldn't see out. He could only see up. So once he sees the mountain peaks are are kind of exposed 40 days, and then he sends out a raven. And the Bible says the raven just kind of goes back and forth. And that's all we get about the raven. And I've read a whole bunch of stuff about how the raven is an unclean bird, and, you know, it's a symbol for this and for that. Could be, but maybe not, too. The point is, he sent out a raven, and it just flew around, okay? And then we come to verses 8 through 12, which tells us the story of the dove. And of course, if you've been in the Bible much or you've been around church much, you understand all of the um, 
implications or the illustrations and the analogies of what a dove is, right? And, and you think about a dove, uh, the, the Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove at His baptism, and, and the dove being a symbol for the Holy Spirit and all these things. But really, here's the point of it. It says in verse 8, also He sent forth a dove from Him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark. I don't, this just, this is the way I think. You know, I'm a little wacky, right? Why only one foot? Don't know. But I'm like, why didn't she not find rest for the sole of her feet? Don't know. Maybe she only had one. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I'm just weird. I think about that. And she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her in and pulled her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet other seven days. So he waits a week, and then again he sent forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove came in unto him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. Now the water is low enough that there's trees that are growing again and producing leaves. So it's getting better. All right? She brings the olive leaf. And some people, you know, will say, well, the olive leaf, the olive, the olive oil is anointing and it represents, you know, the Holy Spirit and it represents medicine. That could be. We don't know, but it could be. But the point is this. The waters are getting lower. Noah's getting closer to being able to get off the ark. Verse 12, and he stayed yet other seven days, another week, and sent forth a dove, which returned not again unto him any more. So that is great news. Because now that means the dove has found a place to live and have found a place to eat, which means the waters have to be down enough that it's almost time for everybody else to get off the ark. So 8 through 12, the dove actions, the dove's actions after three weeks show us the dove found a place to stay, which signified the waters were now gone and life could inhabit the earth again. That's a lot of time that's gone by. Can you imagine? Let me give you an example. When you travel somewhere, at least for me, this is one of my pet peeves that just drives me insane. I don't care if we're going down the street two minutes to Kroger, or we're going to Florida in the car. When we get where we're going, and we pull into the parking lot, and we find a spot, because I don't know about any other guys, you, you're looking for the spot, right? And your wife finally just says, just pull in somewhere, right? You know? And I, I don't know what magic thing we're looking for, but we're just looking for that spot. And, and you're driving around the parking lot, finally you find it, you pull in, you turn off the car, you get out, you close the door, And you're the only individual standing outside the door. And you begin to wonder. Everybody is asleep. And then all of a sudden, a door opens. And one of the kids, you know, kind of rolls out. Straightens up their their pants and straightens their sleeves and takes their earbuds out. Puts them in the case. And and you're like, come on! You know, like, we're here! Can we go? And it's just like you're just waiting forever for them to get out of the car so you can go in to wherever it is that you want to go. Maybe just me. Just need to get that off my chest. But it drives me insane. I don't know why it takes 10 minutes to get out of the car, but it does. So can you imagine parking the ark? Right? You've been in this smelly, awful (laughs) ship for all these months, and you're just fresh air, right? Can I walk on the ground? Can I get out and breathe something that's not animals, right? And you got to wait. The dove goes out, comes back. Wait a week. Dove goes out, comes back with an olive branch. Wait a week. The dove goes out, stays gone. Okay, now we're making pro- Drive me insane. Probably why God didn't, I didn't find grace in the eyes of the Lord back then. I'm not the guy to build the ark. Anyway, we come to verse 13 and 14. And it came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, 
and Noah removed the covering of the ark, would have been some kind of probably animal hide, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seven and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. So the first time he looks out, he takes off the animal hide, and he looks out there, and he sees maybe there were some puddles, right? Maybe it was real soggy still. But now, a little bit later, about a month and a couple days later, there we are for real this time. It is dry, dry. Now it's time to get out of the boat. Thank the Lord, right? Verse 15 through 17. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of the fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and they that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply on upon the earth. So he says, get out. It's time for you to go. Bring everything out and everyone go out and be fruitful and multiply. In other words, the new earth replenish the earth. Okay, that's why we brought two of every kind onto the, onto the ship, Noah. Send them out and replenish the earth. The call to be fruitful and multiply is reminiscent of Genesis 1, 22, and 28. When God told the animals to do so and would eventually tell people to do so. Now, I, I told you about this parallel here between chapter 8 and chapter 1, the call to be fruitful and multiply. I have a, a chart that we're going to put up on the screen here, um, and that's really hard to read from where you're at. So I'll, I'll try to explain it to you. I'll give you the passages, okay? And we will look at this. So Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 8 have some really cool parallels. You have creation in Genesis chapter 1, where God creates certain things on certain days, and give certain commands on those days. What's fascinating to me is in chapter 8, we read that God commands very similar things on very similar time frame for the earth to experience what we might call recreation. After it was destroyed by the flood, God in essence says, now go out and do what Adam and his people and those animals were supposed to do in the first place. All right? So let's look at the parallels here. Day one. So you might want to like keep a finger in Genesis 8 and Genesis 1. So you can flip back and forth real fast, okay? So day one, Genesis 1, 2. It says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So get the picture. You get earth, you get deep, you get the word spirit, which is the Hebrew, the Hebrew word ruach, okay, and waters. You see those words there in, in verse 2? Now flip over back to chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Notice, see these words. And God remembered Noah and every living thing, and the cattle was with him in the ark, and God made a wind. You know what that Hebrew word is? Ruach. The same word for spirit in chapter 1. To pass over the earth and the waters. Another word we read in Genesis 1-2. You see the words wind, earth, waters, and deep in 8, 1 and 2. The recreation, the going back in. It's all starting over, okay? So day 2. Back to Genesis 1, verses 7 and 8. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So the second day, what do we see? We see a separation of the waters, water and sky, atmosphere and water. God put some space in between them, right? That's what we see on the next day of creation. Now go to 8, 2. 
and the fountains also of the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. What are we being shown again? This time, the waters are stopped, and heaven, the, the firmament, same words. The recreation after stepping off the ark, God is remaking these things. Day three, Genesis 1.9. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. The seas, right? And let the dry land appear, and it was so. So on day three, we see water, dry ground, and the word appear. Now go to eight. And look at verses three through five. The waters returned from off the earth continually after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated, and the ark Rested on the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat, and the waters decreased continually until the tenth month, and the tenth month on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. They appear. So you have in day three, water, all the waters are gathered. We see that again. The dry ground appears. We see that again. And we also recall the mountains, land appearing. And in eight, three through five, what does Noah see when he looks up? He sees the ground appear. Recreation. God is bringing everything back just like he did the first time. Remember what God created on day four? The sun, the moon, and the stars. Those weren't destroyed. So he didn't have to do anything with those. They're still there. So we go to day five. Chapter one, verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So birds above the earth, across the expanse. Eight, seven through eight. What, what do we see? Birds. God sent a raven to and fro. Eight, God sends a dove to see if the waters were abated. Again, we're seeing the animals in the sky, like on day five, when they come off the ark, the next step, the animals in the sky. Day six, all kinds of things happen on day six, right? Genesis 1, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. 8.17, when God brings them off the ark, what happens? Every living thing, all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. The same thing, in the same order. God says it's the new, it's the recreation of everything that we did in the beginning that was ruined by the wickedness of the world. Now that I have judged the earth, we're going to bring it back in the same order. And of course, day six is when man was created. Go back to 126. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, for every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So here we see man made in the image of God. Now this one we're going to have to cheat a little bit and go to Genesis 9, verse 6. So just fast forwarding a little bit. God's talking about some things when they get off the ark, some, some ways that uh, they're going to have to, some rules they're going to have to keep to keep things okay. Verse 6, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. God created with man became a living soul. Look at this. For in the image of God made he man. They get off the ark. And they're reminded again, you, all these other creations, all these other creatures, they're great looking, they're cool, they matter, but you, people, humans, man, you were the only ones created in God's image, and you are extremely special. Creation. Genesis 1 walks us through that order that God created everything in. 
We come to Genesis 8 after the destruction of the world, the recreation, same order. Tell me that our God is not a God of order. Tell me that our God doesn't have a way that he does things. Tell me that our God does not care about the details, right? He cares about all these things. These things don't happen by accident. I mean, this just lines up the kind of God that we have. Now, I would like to tell you I found all that of my own accord. I will say that as I studied, I started to see some parallels of some things, creation and recreation, and I started to dig a little bit more. And in one of my commentaries, this chart was in that commentary. So I can't take credit for that chart. That's a copy and paste, okay, from one of my commentaries. But wow, I've read Genesis 8 how many times in my life? And when I'm 40, I'm this many years old, right? When I start to see there's something there. You know, there's some parallel there. There's something that God's doing that reminds me of something that God did. And boom, it hits me upside the head. And thank God for scholars and, and, and teachers and students of the word who can kind of illuminate some of these things for us. But here's my point in saying all that. When we give time to God's word, hopefully we'll be 95 years old reading that book and have something come that we've never seen before. Isn't that great? You, can, you can't exhaust God's... I'm talking about the book of Genesis. It's not like I was like, man, I was back here in Leviticus and you know, the, the chapters that nobody ever read. No, I'm talking about Genesis 8 that we all have kind of figured out. This is Noah getting off the ark and Ararat and all that. And, and, and boom, it just... God hits me with it. There it is, you know? And it's exciting to me. It encourages me. It, it puts excitement in my bones to, to know that when I open this book, that my God is so alive and so powerful and still speaking that there are things that I will see, hopefully, to the day I die that will be new information to me. Learning more about God. Learning more about who He is and what He does and how He treats His creation. That's fascinating to me. It's these kinds of things that kind of stirs your heart to keep just digging, doesn't it? It's so neat. Well, let's finish up this chapter and get into our, st- our um, meeting tonight. So we come to verses 18 and 19. Again, this is one of those redundancies. Look what it says. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. And we're like, no kidding, you've already said that. Again, I just repeat, it's a way of Hebrew writing. It's a, it's a device that Hebrew writers would use. The redundancy is like putting an exclamation point on what God has done, okay? So it's not just them repeating because they couldn't figure out anything else to say, okay? It is, it's a device they use to emphasize what God is doing. We come to 20. We see the first act of worship off the, after the ark rest, and Noah built an altar unto the Lord. That's the first time we see an altar built. There were, there were sacrifices, Cain and Abel, right? This is the first time we see an altar built unto the Lord, It's the first time it's been directed to him specifically and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Remember, this is pre-Mosaic law. So how did Noah know to do that? We don't know. We know that Cain and Abel knew that they were supposed to do some kind of sacrifice. We see here that Noah knew to do some kind of sacrifice. Specifically calls it out as a burnt offering. Don't miss that. A burnt offering was an offering that people would give that was completely consumed. You know, some of the offerings they would give, the the priest would be able to eat those as part of their, their meals and their food and their sustenance, okay? So not every sacrifice was one where the whole thing would just be consumed, but the burnt offerings, burnt makes sense, right? Everything is consumed. And what does this mean? What does this kind of entail? What this is saying is this is an offering of complete devotion. In other words, there's nothing I can get back from this. Everything I'm giving to you, God, is 100% holy, completely yours. Complete devotion. And we read in verse 21 that God is pleased with Noah's offering. It says, and the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, 
I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. So God makes this promise. He smells this offering. That's a blessing to him. It's pleasing to God the way that Noah offered these things unto God. He didn't withhold anything. Notice those words, every, in verse 20. He didn't withhold. He gave it all, and that was a pleasing thing unto the Lord. And God said, you know what? I will never destroy the ground again the way I've done it here. Although man from his youth is sinful, I will not do this again this way. What does this teach us? Sin is pervasive from our youth up. God is judge and forgiver. And God alone can bring life from death. We finish verse 22. While the earth remaineth, God says, seed time and harvest and cold and heat. Does that make sense to you? That's our seasons, right? And summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. What's God saying? Instead of destruction, there will be predictable patterns that are directed by God to bring life. Isn't that great? Winter, time of dead stuff, right? Everything's dead, brown, gray, okay? But God says, spring's coming. He says, from now on, there are going to be seasons, and those seasons are what? They're a testament to his, what's the song? Faithfulness. What a gracious God. What a life-giving God. And he says, from now on, I'm even, you can even mark it down. Every three months about, things are going to change. It's going to be a pattern from here on out that I am faithful, that I'm going to provide, that I'm going to give you what you need, that I can bring life from death. You can count on it, God says. Phenomenal.